So this webinar is hosted by the Northwest Fire Science Consortium. Uh, we're a regional network of partners who work together to communicate uh, the, the latest and most relevant wild and fire science between managers, practitioners, and scientists. And these webinars are usually hosted by the fantastic Autumn Ellison. She is the coordinator of the Northwest Fire Science Consortium. Uh, she is having some severe computer issues. She was calling me on the phone. So I'm going to take over. I know it won't be as good as Autumn, but I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction. So first of all, welcome. We're really glad to have you all here today. Uh, the Northwest Fire Science Consortium hosts webinars as part of the efforts that it does to uh, communicate that current wildland fire science among those communities that it serves. And we're honored that you will join us today. Um, for those of you who would like to learn more about the Northwest Fire Science Consortium, I'm going to go ahead and put a link in the chat. Oh, I might not be able to do that, Carrie. Maybe you could share it with the participants. Um, Carrie's going to put a link in the chat where you can go to learn more about our work. Thank you. So I'm going to get started today by just asking uh, folks to share in the chat uh, what what your what kind of your relationship to this work of media coverage of wildfire is. Are you a member of the media? Are you a public information officer? Are you a land manager? Just go ahead and put it in the chat. It's great to see. We really appreciate all of you coming today. Um, I can't see the chat, unfortunately, due to my technical issues, but I think you're all putting things in there, so that's good. Cheryl, did you have a question? That is disabled. Okay. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, Carrie, do you know how to enable the chat? I will work on that. Thank you for your patience with us. We're flying without our pilot. But for now, the Q&A is available to you. So feel free to put um, any questions or issues that come up in the Q&A. So for this webinar, we are going to be speaking um, we are gonna be speaking for about 30 minutes. It's a little shorter than some of the traditional webinars that you see scientists give. And that's because we're wanting to practice what we preach and leave time for, for discussion. Um, we really in particular are interested in feedback from those of you who have either read this guide and have been using it or who haven't had the time to read it yet, that's okay, but have input on this topic in general. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the slideshow. A quick second. So just a little bit of housekeeping, please stay on mute. Uh, we're going to, like I said, try to leave a good amount of time for questions and discussions at the end. So if you have a question, please, you can go ahead and put it in the Q&A or just know that we will, we will take questions at the end. And we also look forward to hearing from you and having discussion from all of you. So why, what are we here to talk about? We're here to talk about a resource guide for media cover, covering fires and related topics in Oregon. And it looks like the chat is disabled and we can't change it because we did not set up the webinar, but we will do the best we can to try to overcome this, this situation. So also as a follow-up, all participants will receive the links that we would have shared. We'll have that available to you. This guide is available on the OSU Extension Fire Program's webpage if you go to that homepage and scroll down. So we're, this guide was released this summer and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our motivation for creating it and what we were hoping to achieve with it. So if any of you have taken the required uh, introduction to incident information F203 class, I know some of you out there have, it talks right away about why wildfire is so exciting and why it warrants media attention. It's one of the events that inspires human curiosity along, you know, fires, floods, earthquake, wars. And in my workbook, which I have right here, you know, we're drawn to these events because they have these elements of crisis, drama, danger, destruction, conflict, suspense, and they're, and they're rare and unique. And they're really noteworthy as well. Fires are noteworthy to people because they may be relevant to you, your family, your community. They can have a lot of effects on people, and they're something that basically media are crucial messengers in sharing. Media are required to share both essential information about safety to audiences that are that most directly affected and to respond to that broader interest of audiences for all those reasons that fire is so exciting. 
Um, also, as many of you know, I think most of you are here from Oregon today, we've been experiencing increased wildfire and smoke impacts over the last decade. So it's becoming more and more of something that people are tuning in to, to know about. And at the same time that media are being asked to cover wildfires more, media are also facing more constraints in terms of their resources, staffing of newsrooms, and their own time, and balancing uh, you know, their, their busyness with the having to be on a deadline, having to do multiple stories and having multiple beats as well that they need to cover. So given all of this context, a group of us who are involved in wildfire related research and extension and engagement just started having informal conversations late in 2021. We were thinking about, you know, how is our world of wildfire changing in Oregon and how is media coverage shifting or needing to shift in response to this? So. We're a group of extension practitioners, social scientists, public information officers, and journalists from Oregon State University, the University of Oregon, and the Oregon Department of Forestry. And through those conversations, we traded notes and we identified a big picture goal, which was that we really wanted to support evidence-based reporting on wildfire. We also wanted to support effective relationships and communication among all of the entities that are involved. So media themselves, incident personnel, public information officers, and fire scientists. So from that broad goal, from that broad interest, we identified that we wanted to find somewhere to start and something tangible that we could put out that would be useful. We recognized there was a lack of kind of an updated current one-stop shop information resource for journalists that was targeted towards both that operational need to know that they need to have in hand in order to go out and do reporting on fire, but also broader context about history, the natural role and the setting of fire in Oregon, unique to our state. Something we really recognize is that, you know, wildfire story looks different and therefore needs to be told differently given that we have such an ecologically, culturally and socially diverse state. So to meet this need, we decided to create this resource guide. It's a publication that puts this in one place and we developed a process for assessing needs and building the guide that we're gonna talk about today. I wanna stop for a sec and acknowledge that we also have an important piece of legislation um, that is that is in this, in this realm as well. So Oregon House Bill 4087 uh, took effect on January 1st of 2023 this year. The law allows media representatives to access wildfire or other disaster sites on Oregon public lands that would be otherwise closed to the public during these incidents but it doesn't apply to private property, federal land, tribal land, or property owned by educational institutions. So this bill requires media in turn to take a mandatory safety training and follow all access protocols. And I just wanna acknowledge that our guide has references and resources related to this, but it does not replace and is not an official material affiliated with this. Um, you can review the official guidance about this bill to understand those resources and what that training entails. And if we get our chat up, we will go ahead and put that in the chat. So today, what to expect from us, I'll be passing the mic around to my colleagues. We'll each be taking a few minutes to talk about different pieces of this guide. Uh, first, Holly Smith, who's an associate professor of science and environmental communication at the University of Oregon School of Journalism and Communication, will cover how we conducted research to learn about the needs and how we use that to inform what we would create. Then it'll come back to me and I'll give a brief overview of the content in this guide, just sort of a high level high points. Then we'll pass it over to Dan Morrison. Dan is a professor of practice who's also at the University of Oregon. And he will spend a few minutes sharing his perspectives and advice as a photojournalist with many years of covering wildfire from his base in Eugene, Oregon. And then next, Carrie Berger, who is OSU Extension's fire program manager, will speak to some of the creative story ideas that she developed and shared in this guide that can help expand reporting on wildfires beyond the event itself. And then, as I said, we will be trying to wrap up in a relatively quick time so that we can hear your, your knowledge, your questions, your ideas, and have ample time for discussion. We have a few discussion questions that we'll be addressing and we will keep us, I will keep us all moving along so that we make good on that promise to end relatively early. So with that, I'm gonna go on mute. I'm going to go on mute in a minute and I'm going to pass it over to Holly. All right, so uh, thank you, EJ. So as EJ mentioned, I'm an associate professor of science and environmental communication in the School of Journalism and Communication at UO. 
And EJ and I have worked together before. And as we were talking about this guide, we wanted to make sure that it was grounded in the actual needs of people doing this work on the ground. We didn't want to make any assumptions about what would be useful to people um, or about the experiences that individuals doing this work were having. So uh, we sought some grant funding and we hired graduate students to go out and do uh, semi-structured interviews uh, with media professionals here in Oregon. So we interviewed 16 media professionals who had covered wildfire in Oregon, uh, six public information officers, and 15 fire scientists based in Oregon as well. And what we asked, we had different interview protocols for each, but some common questions. And we really wanted to know uh, what were journalists experiencing, experiencing as they were covering fire? And then what were the relationships like um, among these th three groups? And so what we found was that all three groups, I think it's really important to highlight, um, identified mostly positive experiences with one another. Uh, there were negative experiences, but they were less common and they usually happened on an individual basis. Um, so there were you know, stories told about somebody showing up to a fire in flip-flops um, you know, or something like that, where it was just like this one-time thing. It was not a consistent theme. Um, among the groups. And so I think that that is really important. Um, regarding positive experiences, uh, participants highlighted how meaningful relationships were fostered when they worked together toward common goals in these high stress situations and also through uh, exhaustion. And when we talked to journalists about their experiences covering fire, they talked about their role in two distinct ways. The first was talking about uh, as being a public informant, particularly during fire events. So this was a time when public safety is paramount and they saw their role as providing real-time information so people could make decisions and being that kind of messenger and that connector between what's happening on the ground and the public. Uh, the priority during this was public safety. Then they talked about uh, other other kinds of stories that they would write. And they talked about these in the language of second day stories. And this was providing more context about a fire. Uh, and they described fire season as being very similar to a sports season. So you have a preseason when you're doing a little bit of a preview, then you have the active season when you're focusing on public safety and getting information out, a postseason what happened, and then this off season when you could provide more context. Um, several topics of concern did co consistently come up among journalists during interviews, um, including the unpredictability of events um, and sometimes the difficulty in finding information when multiple agencies uh, were involved. So, for example, one journalist said it's really difficult to know uh, who has the information you need. It could be ODF. It could be the Forest Service. It could be somebody local. Um, and sometimes you go to the website or Facebook or Twitter and everybody does it differently. And so it can be really hard to find information or necessarily know uh, where to go. The other thing that I think is really important to highlight is journalists said uh, they wanted additional training on how to sensitively communicate with victims and also mental health resources to better manage the demands of their own jobs. So they talked about how difficult it was uh, to cover fire um, and knowing exactly how to navigate some of that with professionalism, uh, but also understanding what is appropriate information to share and what is not, and then al also how to talk to sources in a way that is sensitive to the situation. And then many of them talked about the toll that it takes on them as journalists and needing mental health resources to care for themselves. I also think it's important to note that we did ask, you know, is access important? Um, and regardless of profession, uh, participants tended to link their opinions on access to safety concerns, uh, with most stating that journalists should only get close to the fire if there is clearly no risk to themselves and they are not posing risks to others involved. 
Um, so there was a group of journalists, uh, primarily photojournalists, who believed that access was essential in fire coverage. And they noted that an enhanced journalist's ability to convey what is happening on the ground more accurately, while also having the possibility of visually showing the level of impact of the fire and the work being done to combat the fire. Now, this is just like a little bit of what people talked about. Uh, people talked about also the need for more context and the need for talking about the diverse kind of issues that are involved with fire management, including uh, cultural burning and how that is not seen enough in the media. The last thing that we asked all of our participants is if we were going to create something like this, something like this guide, what would you want to see in it so we can be responsive to participant needs? And what we saw is what you can see here on the screen. Um, so pretty universally, we had some big top themes. So people really wanted a list of common firefighting terms. It's a whole different language uh, that people are speaking. And so what are the list of the terms mean? Um, and just having that easy access. And so we know that there this exists elsewhere, but we wanted to put it in here to be responsive uh, to what participants said they needed. Um, a list of PPE and safety tips, along with links of where to get PPE, uh, mental health resources to help deal with trauma. One of the biggest things that people said they wanted was a list of sources. They wanted a list of names, phone numbers, contact info for who to call. This is something we couldn't necessarily put in the guide because it changes so much. Um, but we did put uh, links to agencies and institutions where people can go and find somebody to talk to. Journalists also said that they wanted best practices. So lessons from other journalists who were more experienced. Uh, maps of the state, better understanding who to talk to in different areas, and then also a breakdown of management structure and fire history, ecology, and context. Um, and so before I turn it off, the other thing I would like to mention um, is that one thing that participants brought up that I think is important for this webinar and in context was that uh, there was mutual respect among the group and they everybody acknowledged that everyone had different professional norms and demands on their time. And each group said, it's just helpful when there's a little bit of preparation when I'm interacting with the other group. So if a journalist shows up, it's super helpful if they have read our agency website and have good questions. Um, journalists said, it's super helpful if a PI know, PIO knows what the different needs are for TV journalists, print journalists, and visual journalists. And if they can think about that a little bit in advance and kind of have options of where people can get video and B-roll, then that is super helpful. So just having that little bit of mutual respect um, and accommodation is incredibly helpful for building trust and, and meaningful relationships. And so I think I will stop there and I'm happy to answer any questions um, at the end. Thank you so much, Holly. So. As Holly noted, it was important for us to understand both what people wanted to know as well as how we could most effectively put this in a publication. And I don't I don't think we did it perfectly because as you can see there were a lot of topics that people wanted to cover. We were also trying to keep it short and accessible. Um, I think it turned out 30 something pages, so you, you can be the judge. But one thing we tried to do was in each a uh, section of the of the guide, we provided a section summary at the beginning, which is just really the top key points in a few bullets that we wanted people to most understand. We ended each section with a list of resources uh, that were for further reading or expansion on what we had talked about in that section. We also included many of these helpful information sources. And of course, it, it, these are evolving information landscapes. So in the future, as these really top relevant sources change, we will update the guide to reflect that. So I want to note that we, um, we, we ended up developing four sections, and this is where the partnership was really awesome and where it was really effective. Because, you know, for example, our first full draft led with the ecological context and history and how to engage with fire scientists. Because those of us who are from the fire science background, we were like, yeah, that's the most important thing. we got to put that right up front. That's an essential foundation. And then our wise colleagues from the journalism and communication side said, we have to provide media with what they really most importantly want to know up front. This is that operational need to know, those realities of getting ready to go to a fire event, being at a fire event. And so we rearranged our guide entirely to try to be responsive to this. So 
quickly, I'm going to cover what each of these sections contains, just a little tidbit of, of what, what they offer. Uh, what the first section is this op kind of operational, what to expect, how to prepare yourself. The second is laying out some of that context of how land is managed in Oregon and how different um, fire response looks different across those jurisdictions. Uh, this third section provides that key ecological and social context, that diversity that we have around the state. And then four is about actually using relationships with scientists to enrich reporting. So in the first section, what to expect when covering fire in Oregon, this is kind of a level setting, okay? So you're gonna go out there, what's it going to be like? What do you want to know? What do you need to have in your mind and physically on hand? How can you be physically and, and mentally prepared? Um, one key message we wanted to share in there was that if you've been to one fire, you haven't been to them all. So fires look really different and they're organized very differently depending on their complexity and they're organized differently as well, depending on you know what point in fire season and how many other resources are available or not available, all of this. So to respond to that, we provided information about the incident command system, what that looks like, who you go to for information within that, um, equipment and considerations. We created a handy glossary of fire operations terminology that's alphabetized. And then some advice on things like using drones safely. So our hope is that anyone who reviews that section feels a little better prepared for reporting on fire. And then the second section of our guide further sets the stage. So we're, we are a state with a number of different land management agencies. We also have a large extent of private land. Some parts of the state have a lot of private land and some don't, some are mostly federal land. Um, so this is really important because it, it, it determines who you're going to interact with and who has responsibilities for preparing for, responding to, and recovering from fire. So we explore the roles of the different tribes, federal, state, and local governments. And we offer tips you know, on things like metrics to use when reporting on fire, which Carrie will cover in more depth shortly as well. It includes ideas for stories and ways that you can expand reporting on fire beyond the just the event itself. And, and really importantly, given fires, ecological and cultural roles, not all fires are managed for a full suppression strategy. And it's really important to be precise in the terms that you use and understanding the context in which you're doing it. This is also really important as over time, we have more and more fires happening and some communities are repeatedly experiencing fire. In the third section, we dive into both the ecological and the social big picture. And there's a lot, there's a lot contained in this section. We're hoping that readers will enjoy sections one and two so much that they'll make it to section three. This is that context. So, but you know, we make points like fire is not a new phenomenon in Oregon. Um, and it's been an inextricable part of indigenous knowledge and life. We sort of cover, you know, in different parts of Oregon, what's the historical role of fire been? What do you, what do you expect from fire? Does it happen frequently? Does it happen infrequently? Can it be expected to be more severe? Even though we're dealing with a change in climate and we address that as well, the, these references or these fire regimes are really important. And then we also have a great section by, by Holly that has essential insights on what makes communities vulnerable to wildfire. That's the diagram on the right. And it's a complex web of different social and economic factors. So what we really, our goal there is to help people understand that reporting can respectfully and appropriately tell these human social stories of why we're at risk of fire and what we need to do to live with fire, uh, including aspects like how do we cover indigenous people and their relationships with fire while avoiding tropes and inaccuracies. And then finally, since we're scientists, we think science has a role to play and we wanted to get that in there. So we know this is probably the least urgent, but we still see it imp as important, which is this topic of how media can include the expertise of scientists in the reporting. Um, we acknowledge that scientific perspective isn't needed or isn't feasible for every single story about fire, but scientists can provide invaluable knowledge about how fire works. You know, they have many fields of science. There are many different fields of science that are relevant to wildfire. So there's a diversity of knowledge out there. And this can really enrich stories with details and contextual information that, that make them stronger. Um, we, you know, we recognized when we were doing this that certain scientific voices have been elevated a lot over time and others not. And we have a challenge in the scientific in scientific professions with, you know, primarily privileging and uh, and highlighting scientists from dominant cultures. So, you know, reaching out to 
the diversity of scientists that are out there in terms of their identities and what they study, like, for example, reaching out to social scientists, if you have policy, economic or social dimensions you're trying to cover in wildfire, because they're best equipped to address those. So now I'm going to hand it over to Dan, who just for a few minutes is going to share some perspective, given all of his experience that he has as a photojournalist. So he's just going to talk for a few minutes, then we'll be passing it over to Carrie for some of those story ideas, and then we'll be wrapping up. Thank, thank you, EJ. Mike, good. Everybody can hear me fine. Um, I actually covered the Yellowstone fire in 1988. That's how far back this goes. But I've been covering the fires here in Oregon intensively for the last four years, and I counted them up last night. I've covered 21 fires, and the larger ones, which burn for weeks, that means multiple trips out to those fires. So um, here's some things that I that I wish I had known certainly four years ago when I started which is, this is such a complex thing you're trying to cover. And I'm just going to talk to you from the perspective of photojournalists because that's what I do these days. But it's a, when you get out to a fire, it's a fire. Like, well, yeah, but it's not just a fire and they're just trying to put it out. That It is incredibly complex how wildfires are fought and who fights them. And the more you know, the more access you're going to get. You're going to have to operate through the PIOs and the PIOs are human beings. And if you irritate a PIO, your chance of getting access to a fire has been dramatically reduced, I assure you. So there's a lot of things you need to know. We are not in California. We're in Oregon. And so EJ mentioned House Bill uh, 4087. I would urge you to read that very carefully because I've talked to lawyers about what it actually says. But you need to know in Oregon, we have dramatically different uh, rules and regulations than what they go by in California, which essentially there are no rules down there. But there's just an awful lot you need to know about fires. Um, uh, EJ showed you the map. There's state-owned properties and there's feds, and you need to know the difference. Where's the fire? Is it an ODF fire, meaning it's on private land in general, or there are structures involved, and structures usually mean houses. And if so, you're going to be working through ODF. And ODF has a very different approach to fighting fires than the feds do. If it's in a national forest or federal land, it's a whole different situation. And you need to know that. Um, ODF, again, like I just said, if, it's, if there's structures involved, there's homes involved, you'll be dealing with ODF. And I will tell you that in general, the rule is you are probably not gonna photograph, certainly not actively burning structures and probably not burning structures until they're absolutely sure that everybody has been notified the owners of that property have been notified of the condition. So if you think you're going to run out to a fire somewhere and get pictures of homes that are burning or structures that are burning like you see coming out of California, you're, you're probably not. I would also just tell you, it's like, boy, you got to understand basic fire science, you, you know, the different kinds of fires there are, because there is a lot. It, it is so amazing to me to learn about how fires work. I was, to this day, after four years of doing this, it's still amazing to me that a fire burning in a root system of a tree can burn through the winter and reignite in the spring. I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? It's like, no, this fire started last May and, and then in the next May, it, it blows up again. It's like, wow, who knew that? So you need to know all this. And again, the more you know, it's been mentioned, you know, building trust with the PIOs. I don't know how many PIOs there are in, in Oregon. It's not that many, but they get to know you and they get to know who will, will listen to them and who will try to do things they're not supposed to do. And once you build trust with them, once they know that they can take you out to a fire, you can get almost unlimited access. The picture you're looking at on the screen right now is of, of a, a controlled burn that they were doing. And that was shot at about 1 a.m. in the morning up on a ridge line. And they took me up there because I had gone out on multiple fires by then. And they trusted me. But you're not going to get access to that until they know they can trust you. You need to know you are potentially, at, or not potentially, you are asking permission to be escorted out to a potentially lethal situation. Fires kill people, all right? And it kills people in very strange ways. Trees fall and they crush people. You could step very easily into a hot spot in up to your waist where it's 2,000 degrees. You have to know what you're doing. You're asking somebody, a he or a she, to take you out to a situation like that so you can get a dramatic photo like this. And it's like, why should they, quite frankly? Okay, so you're not in charge. They are for very good reason, for safety reasons, your own, but also certainly the firefighters. So you need to understand the command structure. Who's really in charge? PIOs, 
you know, or who you're going to work with. And they, and I've 99% of them, I have a good relationship with. There's one or two who are not terribly fond of me, but they're ter terrific people. And they really go do everything they possibly can to get you access to a fire. But you need to know that's great. And then you explain to the PIO, you give them two days, no, or three, four days, you call and say, when can I, can, can I come out, first of all? And if so, when? And it's usually two or three days before you go out, when they give you permission, you go out. But they can be overruled by the operations manager who decides that the fire is just too dangerous that particular day, and it wouldn't be safe for you to go out. And even if the operations manager says yes, the IC himself or herself could say, not today. We just can't deal with it today. So you need to know how the, the, the structure works. You also need what to know what the heck it is you're actually seeing. You're writing captions. There's a huge difference between a line crew and a hotshot crew, and you need to know the difference. If you're photographing things, you've got to write a caption at the very least, and you need to know that to ask intelligent questions. And I will tell you also, for heaven's sakes, you need to know, leave the people alone. I try, it's difficult times, but I always try to get permission to photograph the firefighters. And when they're you know up to their eyeballs in flame and stuff, you're not going to walk up and talk to them. But you want to know, are they okay? This, this is one of the things that still surprises me quite a bit. There is quite a few wildfires who do not want to be photographed. And I have some theories as to why that is. But there's a lot of them that just like, oh, heck no. And so I always try to get sort of a tacit approval from them to go ahead and photograph them, okay? Don't interfere. You're going to want to, I, I, I'm a photojournalist, been one for years and years and years. You want to shoot with that wide angle 24 and get as close to the firefighter as I am to this guy. Most of the time, you are not going to be able to do that. And just know that you got to stay a safe distance away and don't ever do anything to interfere with what they're trying to do. They are risking their lives to fight a fire and you do not want to get in their way. I assure you, um, you also need to make sure that you always obey the, the, whatever the PIO tells you to do, do it without question. Also never walk away from a PIO without asking permission and, and telling them exactly what you intend to do. Can I go shoot this photo over here? Can I walk over there? They are in charge of keeping you safe and alive. And they're also in charge to make sure that you don't endanger one of the firefighters. That's a huge rule. You also need to know about safety gear, PIO or not PIO, PPE. Like they will provide, if you give them advance notice, they will provide all the PPE you need, the protective gear, with the exception of boots. You got to have your own boots, and those things only cost about six fifty. But but I will just tell you, the more gear that you bring there, the more they're going to like you. They assume you know what the heck you're talking about, including a fire shelter, which costs also six fifty. But I've never had to deploy a fire shelter, and I've never been through that training to tell you the truth. But the more gear that you show up with. Uh, and it's a fairly extensive list of gear, it's in the, our guidebook, the better off you are, okay? Um, that's that's pretty much it. You also need to be in relatively, I mean, you don't have to do the the pack test where you have to carry a 40-pound pack three miles in under 45 minutes. You don't have to do that, but I assure you, I've never been out to a fire yet that wasn't strenuously demanding to cover it, okay? And you got to stay hydrated. It is tough. There, they have last this summer. They took me out in a fire line, and I just had to say, I, I can't do this. The, it was so steep, so it's it's not it's not a picnic. I mean, it's physically demanding, and you you got to be ready for it. Um, again, I, you know, the trauma you need to know where that kind of help is, uh, and be prepared. But the main thing is just know, like when you're doing this, you're going into it's almost like a crime scene. I mean, it was mentioned it's like or a, a sports scene. Yeah, it's also like visiting a crime scene. Or um, I don't know what else. I mean, it's like it, it's it's and there's evidence laying around. It is dangerous when you go out there. It is dangerous. I think it's a manageable risk if you know what you're doing. And certainly, if you listen to the PIOs, they will do everything they can to get you the images you want. But you need to make sure you follow their directions. They understand fire at a much much deeper level than normal people do, and they know what is and isn't safe. So that's basically what I got. Thank you so much, Dan. I'm handing it over to Carrie now. And you might be wondering, wait a second, why are we at a football game? Carrie will explain. <laughs> Can you hear me okay, EJ? Yes. Great. Okay. So my name is Carrie Berger, and I'm the fire program manager for Oregon State University's Extension Fire Program. And so I grew up in Wisconsin, and it seems that being a Packer football fan is embedded in Wisconsinites' DNA. It's like 
I didn't have a choice. I was just born a Packer fan. My boys who didn't grow up in Wisconsin um, seem to have inherited this trait as they are also huge Packer fans. Every week they look to the various platforms to read and watch news and stories of the team, who's injured that week, uh, what the projections are for winning versus losing and more. And then it's Sunday and it's football madness. There are ups, there are downs, there's yelling and there's cheering. So much emotion goes into that day. When the new year comes around and football games wind down, they track their favorite football players throughout the year and then come ready for the new season. This whole year of tracking, reading and watching influences their actions. For example, who they'll pick to be on their fantasy football teams. So maybe some of you are Duck or Beaver football fans and can relate, or maybe not. And so why am I sharing this football story in today's webinar? Well, I'm sharing this story because I'd like to emphasize what Holly mentioned earlier at the beginning of the webinar, and that is to think of reporting on a fire season like it's a sports season or an election cycle where there are preseason stories, the season itself, then postseason stories, and um, off-season or ongoing stories. We all know that the time during a wildfire event is stressful and can be quite chaotic. By expanding beyond event-specific stories, the media has the power to change lives. What I mean by this is that the media can report on stories that get people thinking about preparing for the next season, or report on stories that help people and communities recover and build resilience. Reporting also on the science and history, as previously mentioned, of fire can bring an understanding of the natural role fire has across Oregon's landscape so that when fires do occur, it's not so shocking to people. So I'd like to just share a quick example of how the media has had influence on my life and part of my fire story. So besides the Peshtigo fire that happened in Wisconsin in the late 1800s, I didn't really hear much about wildfire during my youth. And so when I moved to Oregon in 2001, wildfire honestly wasn't really on my radar. Fast forward through the years of my professional and personal experiences, and in 2014, I was touched by a story I read in a news article about a community that came together to mitigate their collective wildfire risk following a close call wildfire season. It was through the lens of this article that I could see my family in that story, which then inspired me to take action and not just to help my family, but my entire community. It was because of this article that I became aware of the possibilities and felt a sense of agency to do something rather than nothing. So I'm sure we all have stories like this to tell based on something we've read or heard that it has expired or inspired or influenced us to act. So to follow a sports team, to vote for a candidate, or to prepare, adapt, or recover from wildfire. EJ, next slide, please. In the media guide, we provide a diversity of story ideas for media coverage throughout the year to expand beyond coverage of just those wildfire event stories. So perhaps pre-wildfire season stories are shared about fire preparedness and mitigation where people are taking proactive measures to protect their homes, their community, or even the landscape. During post-fire season, a storyline could focus on community recovery and resilience and how individuals and organizations are coping with the impacts of fire and working to repair damage to social ties, physical infrastructure, or local economies. Then in the off season, uh, or for those ongoing stories, as mentioned earlier, again, stories could focus on the science and history of fire or any new fire legislation. In this past legislative session, for example, a state-backed liability prescribed fire pilot program was approved to increase the pace and scale of prescribed fire and cultural burning to also reduce the barriers for conducting those burns and to support coverage for losses from an escaped prescribed or cultural burn. This is impactful information in the fire world and is applicable to many people, including cultural fire pr practitioners, 
private landowners, non-governmental entities, companies, contractors, operators, you name it. If this information was reported on, it could influence getting more good fire on the ground to help mitigate against those catastrophic wildfires. I'll end by stating the obvious, but stories do change lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, so we are wrapping up. I just wanna thank my colleagues for uh, what they've presented today and just reiterate this was a really great partnership because we each had different pieces that we wanted to bring to this, the social science ability to assess the needs of uh, the perspectives of actually doing this on the ground and the experience of how do we offer things that are engaging and supportive and respectful of the, of the audience that we're trying to reach. So it was a great team and I just wanna thank each of them. Uh, in a minute, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Carrie will put these questions in the chat, but we'd love to have some discussion with you Starting with this question, you know, if you've read the guide or just watching this overview today, which aspect of the guide is most relevant to you? And I'm going to ask you to either use your hand raise function or um, go ahead and put it in the chat if you are more comfortable with that. And Carrie will manage that because I can't see the chat, I don't think. Don't be shy. We love to hear from you. So which, what of all of this, which is the most relevant and, and why? Why is it? Why is it useful? Are there are there some parts of this that really stand out to you? I'm gonna give you a minute to work on your shyness. I'm wondering if we have anyone who is a public information officer who would like to share. I know we have quite a few PIOs out here, it looks like. Any public information officers, you know, which pieces of this guide seem the most relevant to you? You can put it in the chat if you don't want to raise your hand. Thanks so much, David. One of the reasons we're asking this question is because we've created this guide and we're kind of, we're thinking about, this is a great partnership. We're thinking about what we might do next and how we would learn from the guide. And we want to think in particular about what the most important information is to people out there and what might be missing that isn't, or that needs to be further, maybe is out there, but needs to be further emphasized. All right, I'm gonna pitch it to my plant, Dan. Dan, what are some of the things that you thought were most important that we needed to highlight in our guide, just concisely? Uh, actually, I thought the guide could have been four times longer. If you said it's 30 pages, we, we as you know, because you edited some of my stuff, I thought, there, <laughs> again, it is such a complex um, thing that you're trying to cover as a journalist. The Certainly the safety factors. You know, most photojournalists know how to handle risk, or at least if they've been a photojournalist for a while. But wildfire is something totally different. I mean, it's when you're out in the middle of a wildfire, it still has the potential to blow up. Uh, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. And assessing the risk of a fire is huge. But I have to just tell you, to me, the thing still after four years, I've been very lucky that a, a couple of, of PIOs have been very generous with their time and tried to, to educate me on how this all works. It is incredibly complex how this works, how this functions. And again, it, it matters whether if you're covering a fire that's ODF because they have a totally different, not totally, but they do have a different mission than the feds and you need to know what's going on. And it's sort of baffling when you first go out, there's like, what are you doing? You're setting fire to the forest. I thought you were trying to put it out. I mean, just the most basic things, but just understanding what it is that, I mean, every, we all understand the, the mission, which is to protect the forest and protect certainly, uh, people and, and structures, but it's like, why do they do what they do? And and all the other things go with it. It's just, I have to tell you, and I've, I've covered a lot mm -hmm. of sort of risky things in my life, but the complexity of the the way firefighters fight fires, it's, it's stunning. And I think at this point, I know a fair amount, but I still have only got the tip of the iceberg, let's say. So one of the things I liked about this guidebook, at the very least, 
If you worked your way through this guidebook before you went to fire, you wouldn't make a complete fool out of yourself. I will tell you, and we all like to make <laughs> That story about somebody showing up in flip-flops, I can assure you every summer, I've been doing this very extensively for the last four seasons, there's always somebody who shows up in high heels too, or somebody shows up in track shoes. I don't mean to pick on the women because men are usually do stupider things than women do, but I mean, there's just people just don't have a clue and, and they and they go out there and it's just, it dry, I'm sure it drives PIOs crazy. That they do it looks that. like we have some uh, comments that I actually want to make sure to highlight. So a couple of our Southern Oregon folks, um, Sophia says, most relevant for me is the trauma-informed approach, you know, re re especially when engaging with students and families. I really appreciate you highlighting that. That was important to us as well um, for the communities, for the reporters themselves, for incident personnel who are running on really little sleep. And Natalie, also from Southern Oregon, added in, you know, highlighting these relationships are huge, um, especially as smaller markets like Medford get new reporters pretty regularly. And there's a lot of fire in your area. Natalie, would you like to add anything about what about your comments about kind of what you found most important? You don't, you don't have to. By the way, hi, Natalie. She's, she's one of the PIOs who is very gracious with her time. I've worked with her a couple of, not with her. I mean, she's been my my escort a couple of times and, and it was she's so helpful uh, trying to get me the access that I need and explain to me what's actually going on. She's terrific. I'm not able to see the hands raised. I apologize for my issues. Carrie, um, would you like to get... Thing I'm going to let uh, Patricia Patricia uh, able to talk now. Go ahead. Well, first off, thank you for doing this. It was really, really good and informative. You know, one of the things that we deal with a lot is um, how do we get the social license so social license to do a lot of treatments ahead of time? And I just wonder if you guys had thought a lot about or any about. Um, you know, the importance of, um, it sounds like you, you have talked about prescribed burning, but even, you know, thinning and wildfire defense around your home. And are there great examples of, you know, it could have been worse, right? If, if the work hadn't been done ahead of time. I think there's been some reporting on that in the Southwest in particular as well as social science, uh, sorry, uh, fuels treatment effectiveness research and social science about that as well. You know, those stories come up. One of the challenges is that it can be hard. It can take a while to undertake a scientific study and and kind of produce that knowledge of what happened. And then, and then um, sometimes it's just in a journal article somewhere, but I have seen some good stories in the Southwest where that's happened. And then just maybe speaking a little bit to the broader role of media and helping explain the 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 necessity of treatments. I know that, for example, in Central Oregon, there's been a lot of work highlighting. You can expect prescribed fire. Here's how you can prepare for it. Here's what to look for. I'll, you know, here's how to here's how to mitigate its effects. Here's why we're doing it and why it helps protect the community. I've seen some of those good examples as well. Yeah, Natalie. Hey guys, can you hear me? Hey, it's, it's Natalie. Sorry, I when you guys called on me earlier, I was multitasking and not <laughs> able to speak. But um, I really appreciate you guys doing this um, and also just uh, having the opportunity to um, be a part of this. I think it was last summer we did the interview. Um, I think I was the one who brought up the flip-flops guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but you know, I think, I think overall, you guys really captured it. Um, you know, I I hugely rely on the relationships because that tells me um, just how in depth we can get. You know, and it, it's based on that trust. So, um, I just like Dan said, it's like once you have those relationships established, it's like I know that he's not going to try to make me look stupid. So I want to get him as much as I possibly can. Um, and I, I think it's that give and take that really is what makes the relationship and then the coverage. Right. Um, so I 
I think that's huge. And I, I appreciate all the relationships that I have with my local reporters. Um, I am from Medford. And so I do get a lot of fires and a lot of new journalists. Um, and my background, actually, I started as a journalist. And so I was lucky in the sense that I had kind of both sides to draw from. I knew what they were up against. And I also knew what I, you know, could and couldn't do to help them get that story. Um, and so I try to take that with me on both sides. And I, I try to work with reporters about, hey, you know, like this is what we can and can't do and why. And this is what fire is and fire coverage and how it impacts people. Um, but I also, on the other side, try to take that with me to PIOs um, and and explain like this is why reporters come at you this way or maybe this is why you know they're they're stressed out or or things like that. So I think understanding both sides is important, and I think this guide really um, helps will help people do that. So thank you for all your work on this. Thanks for that feedback. And, you know, a couple other things in the chat I've seen too, emphasizing the importance of this relationships aspect. I, we definitely thought a lot about how to write about that. How do you support people in these kind of intangible social concepts and do so with, well, being respectful and sort of not taking on a lecturing tone. Holly, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I would say that is one of the things that I think was so prominent in the interviews across the board. People were so uh, empathetic in every group recognized that, you know, the other group was just trying to do their job and that journalists face these like deadline limitations and that PIOs also have uh, responsibility and they have to answer up the chain. And so that they are not always just able to make these decisions. And then, you know, scientists recognizing the same thing. So the limitations of all of these roles. And so it was really nice to see that that was coming out so across the board with so many people that we talked to again, like any negative experiences were really like one off. And I would like to point out that those were like within group as well. So like more experienced journalists were like the new person who's showing up is making us look bad, you know? So it was like within group just as much as it was uh, between group, which is uh, helpful to know. AJ, can I say something? Sure. Let's make it quick. We have two questions lined yeah. up. So Just real fast. Sure. Here's something. And, and again, this is sort of what Holly was talking about. I try to understand that what's going on from the perspective of the other person. In my case, trying to understand why the PIA was not maybe open to what I want. The first couple of days, which as a journalist is important, a fire breaks out somewhere. It is our job to get that story out the day the fire breaks out. It takes a while for the incident command system to set up. It takes a day or two. And you be furiously calling saying, I need permission to come out there and they're not returning your calls. They got way more important things on their mind at that point, trying to get the, the camp set up. And it'll be usually a day or two, just so you know. I mean, as a, as a journalist, if a fire breaks out wherever, Oak Ridge or whatever, I'm going out there the first day. But getting permission to get in and do things, it takes a day or two, and you need to understand why. It's because at that point, the incident command system is trying to get things set up, geared up, and it takes a day or two. There you go. So EJ, we just have a couple more comments in the chat, and we'd like to thank you for those comments. We're not going to be able to get to every one of them. Um, uh, we do have a hand raised, Dylan, I see you and we're going to get to you, but, um, Dominic, do you want to comment any further on, um, what you wrote in the chat? Dominic says on a wider level, do you feel that there are significant differences in how government slash media communicate about wildfire in Oregon versus California? Dan, you touched on this a little bit in your, um, presentation. If you could just give like a 30 second or 15 second response to that. We'll give you a, a 15 second response. Okay. There's, a, there's a court case in California. It goes back to night in the mid seventies where the state, uh, I think state Supreme court judge said they get unlimited access. They need no permission whatsoever in California to cover fires. There is no system of escorts. I called to go get an escort down. And they said, what are you crazy? We don't do that. The, the journalists who cover fires in California are totally unrestricted at every level. That is emphatically not true in Oregon. Oregon, there's a system of 
permissions that you have to get access. And I will tell you, H. Bill 47, and EJ mentioned this, it's like it does not cover federal land and it does not cover state lands, just so you know. HB uh, 4087, everybody said this is going to give us California access. No, it is not. But in California, you, you need to know the judge ruled and they honor this. You can go wherever the heck you want. Just so you Thank know. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. So we're going to turn it over very quickly to Dylan. Dylan, I'm going to allow you to talk here. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi. Hey, thank you so much for that. Um, Just kind of a couple of thoughts. I don't know. I'll try to think of a question to throw in there. But um, uh, I'm a PIO with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. And uh, I thank you guys so much for putting this together because it's helpful for us PIOs also to share particularly when we have new PIOs coming into the fold to kind of know what they might expect from in terms of questions, things like that from the media, like, hey, this is what they might need to know. Um, so it's a really useful tool for, for us as well. Um, and then the sports analogy that you guys used, it's a great one and one that I might steal. And when I put smoke things on people's calendar this time of year they'll kind of like hey this isn't the time to talk about it but you know it's the off season but we gotta get ready for game time um you know it's you don't want to all of a sudden have you know sorry to keep using the sports analogy it's kickoff and we haven't practiced to play at all um so gonna steal that and then i, I really appreciate you touching on the trauma because i mainly deal with smoke and that's kind of abstract when it comes to the the trauma that's out there and the the files at the cause of the smoke and the reality in Oregon is that we have thousands of people who in 2020 lost their homes and so you know years later we can be talking about file and things like that and there's a whole lot of people who lived through crazy experiences and so you know that's something that I'm, I'm really glad and I, um so not really a question but just thanks for thinking about that and putting it in here it's a uh, really good to have so well done for sure <laughs> thank, thank you so much Dylan and we just have a couple minutes left uh I do want to maybe throw out just very quickly what are your greatest future interests and needs and and Rob in the chat kind of set us up for that nicely thank you Rob for your comment um, let's see here if I can quickly find it again, or if one of my colleagues can read it out loud. Um, oh, I can't find it now in, in the, the long list of comments, but if you are interested to come offline and maybe share. I think I can't see it now, but Bob had said, I think Bob had said something along the lines of, you know, there needs to be a, a few page document for the absolute rookies, for the person who's walking in has never covered fire before, um, really distilling down like the top. And, and then I think in that same comment or maybe another comment, I saw something about key term kind of uh, different acronyms and players you might expect to encounter. So Bob, I don't know if you wanna add to that, but that's kind of what I remember. It looks like your comment disappeared somehow. Oh, disconnected. You're welcome to come off mute um, if if you would like and explain that feedback that you had. I probably didn't do a great job. Or you may be having technical issues. So. And I will say that is one of the pieces of feedback that we got. So once we had the guide compiled, we sent it out to multiple working journalists and other people um, to get review. And they were like, it's still too long. <laughs> and so it was really difficult in thinking about how can we maybe do these handouts or what? how can we break this down and to make it more accessible in the, this attention economy, it's really hard to make everything bite size. Since we're coming up on time, I just, I wanna thank you all for coming again. And I'd like to encourage you to please feel free to follow up with us. We are gonna save the chat from this. We It's full of useful information and ideas for us as we kind of consider our next our next moves. But if you would like to reach out to us, um, all of our email addresses are actually listed in the in the publication itself, um, or we're pretty easy to find on Google. And we, we'd love to just hear your feedback about ways we can further uh, work in this space and be helpful to all of your efforts. We appreciate each of you and everything you do and how you help tell these stories of fire in Oregon. Thank you so much for coming.
And I'll put in one last plug for the Northwest Fire Science Consortium since our host wasn't able to do it. Um, this, the Northwest Fire Science Consortium hosts webinars about new, about any topic that helps connect manager science and practitioners uh, around wildfire in Oregon and, and Washington. So you might wanna check them out, sign up for their newsletter and you can learn. It's a good way to keep increasing your fire science knowledge regardless to what position you're in. Thanks everyone and have a great day. EJ, we're going to hang around you, or are we leaving? Let, I just wanted to um, thank you for doing this. And um, thanks, especially for navigating the sort of confusion at the beginning. With Thank you so much. <laughs> Can oh, we um, hey, stop the somehow, recording? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good call. <laughs> Carrie will have to do that. I think Carrie. Oh.